Oh yes, this is the this 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 is the thing I really want to get at too. This is ah, it's so brilliant. And so Piaget was concerned about morality, and he's one of the few psychologists I think who like he nailed it. It's, it, this is like the most important thing Piaget discovered, and maybe it's one of the most important things that a psychologist has ever discovered. It's like, how do you become moral? Well, we already mentioned that when you acquire a behavior, you inevitably acquire it in a social context. So what that means is that right from the time you're little and learning things, the demands of society are encoded in the behaviors that you're allowed to manifest. And so science, to some degree, by the time you behave the way you do behave when you're three, if you've been properly socialized, you already act out the embodied moral structure of your entire community. So, you know, when you talk about laws, you say there's a body of laws. And the body of laws used to be the king. So you had to do what the king said. But now the body of laws is an abstract, conceptual representation. But those representations are actually semantic representations of allowable and not allowable behavior. And so by the time you're three, and you're a law-abiding three-year-old, which means you're well socialized, you're already acting in accordance with the law. The patterns that characterize your being, the behavioral patterns that characterize your being, have already been molded into the patterns that you manifest. And so what that means in some sense is you're already, as Nietzsche would say, an unconscious advocate of your culture, because you're acting it out. Now here's an, exam here's an example of how that can be transformed into actual moral knowledge. So he actually goes and studies kids playing a game. So, Here's an example. So there's a bunch of kids, and they're standing around on the playground, and they're all playing helicopter. Maybe they've just got sticks, and they're all going, zzz, you know, and they're flying their helicopters around, and they're all doing this, and maybe they're diving at each other. And so what's happened is, each kid wants to have a helicopter, and each kid wants to be a good helicopter pilot, but each kid wants to be a good helicopter pilot in the way that other kids appreciate, well, they're being good helicopter pilots. That's tough, eh? So not only do you have to figure out how to coordinate your behavior, you have to figure out how to coordinate your behavior with other people coordinating their behavior in such a way that the shared activity not only does not come to a stop, but proceeds in an enjoyable way. Jesus, that's really tough. Now, if your kid can play well with other kids, that's what they've managed. Okay, so you've got four kids doing this. And there's rules. Actually, there's not. There's rituals that the children are embodying that they've agreed upon while they set up the game. They've just sort of bashed the ideas against each other, and they came up with a solution, and you can tell that because the game is continuing, and everyone is having fun. It's like, is everyone playing nice? Yes, that's an equilibrated play state, and it's a moral organization because all the children are participating voluntarily towards a shared end. And Piaget, for Piaget, that was the model of a functional society. That's so smart. So now imagine that a kid comes along, and maybe he's a popular kid, so he has a reasonable chance of getting into this play group. He'll still be rebuffed like 50% of the time. Whereas if he's an unpopular kid, it's like, forget. They're just not going to let him into the little helicopter circle. And it's probably because he's developmentally delayed or in, in some other way. He doesn't understand how he has to configure his behavior so that he can enter this complex, dramatic scene without disrupting it. Or maybe he's one of those kids who says, I don't want to play helicopter. We should play something else. It's like... No, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're like a creative genius. That's a really bad idea. So what the popular kids do is they sort of side left to the group. Maybe they find a stick because they watch what they're doing. And maybe they find a stick and they sort of start going with the stick. And they're sort of looking to see if that stick helicopter behavior is acceptable to the peers. And maybe, you know, one of their friends sort of notices that they're playing helicopters and they open up the circle and that kid gets to come in and play helicopters. But he might fail at that even if he's popular. Because once the little play thing is going, it's like a play, right? It's got a dramatic structure. You can't just come in there and, you know, start playing basketball or something. So, now, what Piaget noticed was that when children were playing a game, maybe they were playing marbles. And that's a rough game because you can win and lose at marbles. And you might say, well, children shouldn't play competitive games. But if you say that, that's a sure sign that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because all games are competitive and cooperative at the same time, if they share a single goal. And it's really not a game unless there's a goal. Because go games have goals. And so what the children do is they, they organize themselves so they all decide what constitutes an acceptable goal. And the goal with marbles is win some marbles. And lose some marbles without whining about it. That's another goal. And that's an important thing to learn. 
So the children say, well, here's the foundation of our local moral universe. Here's the rules that we're going to abide by. And a lot of those are ritualistic. They might have learned them from other kids. So they play marbles. You extract out a kid and you say, what are the rules for marbles? And if the kid's like seven, they don't know. They can't tell you. But if you put them in with a bunch of other seven-year-olds, they can play marbles perfectly well. So what that means is the morality is coded in their behavior or in the behavior of the group, like a bunch of bees, you know, because there's knowledge in a hive of bees or maybe a school of fish. So it's Im embedded in the child's behavior and in their patterns of action across time. And then if you pull them out, they can only give like a partial account of it. They're not conscious of the morality. It's like you pull a wolf out of a wolf pack and say, well, you know, what's up with the wolf pack? And the wolf, you know, bites you because that's, that's how it answers questions. It's not going to tell you about the rules. It's only later in development that the children become conscious of the rules. And then they become very irritated if people break them. And then only much later do they start to understand that the rules can be adjusted by mutual agreement. And that is associated with the Piagetian development of higher order morality. It's brilliant. You learn your actions. The actions are conditioned by other people. The actions are integrated into a voluntary game. Then the actions are integrated into a series of voluntary games. That's social interaction. Then you learn the descriptions. Then you learn how to manipulate the descriptions. Brilliant. Movement up the higher. So that's Piagetian theory in a nutshell. Constructivism in a nutshell. We'll see you on Thursday.